Good job. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, thanks, uh, Kimberly, wherever you are, and thanks, uh, Karen, as well. And for all of you coming uh, from, I guess, nearby. I, I started at 5 this morning in Los Angeles. <laughs> I had a very nice view of the Dallas airport. And uh, um, very, very glad to be here. I don't think I've been in Springfield for 30 or 40 years. Uh, <clears throat> I, don't, uh, I don't normally uh, come with prepared talking points or speeches, um, but don't get me going. <laughs> I, I, I think you, what you're looking at here is uh, <clears throat> kind of an archaeological dig. So you just want to know what part of the last 50 years you would like to discuss? Uh, <laughs> because I can go on, uh, uh, because I, I teach and I write and I research uh, constantly, and, and uh, it, I'm, never, I'm never entirely sure what people want to talk about. Uh, uh, maybe I should ask you. First of all, I, I publish a, a, a kind of a uh, analytic newsletter every couple of weeks, in particular about the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen, the drug war, the war on gangs, nasty problems that all too often uh, um, result in overextension, excessive military spending, the lack of uh, funding for uh, health care education at home, suppression of civil liberties. So, kind of an endless. Uh, if you want to know my conclusion after 50 years of this is that you can count on it never ending, but there are very important interludes where uh, you can change things and gain ground, gain ground by the inch, and that's what I consider sacred ground. Uh, but uh, even as you gain ground, uh, you arouse uh, your adversaries inevitably to fight back to take the ground back and that's why um, I said it doesn't <clears throat> it doesn't end that may is that news to any of you by now or <laughs> did anybody come here tonight to ask me when it's going to end <laughs> good okay um, let, let me uh, ask you to circulate this if you want to uh, be on the newsletter list it's, it's useful for me as well as uh, leaving behind some books which are sold at the rate affordable to starving students uh, so that I don't feel I'm just dropping in saying a few words and there's no way to remain in touch. Um, it's kind of like the, the newsletter is one way and, and uh, uh, you can email me and it's kind of like my online office hours. All right, having said all that, <clears throat> where would you like me to be? Let me, let me ask you some questions. Do you want to begin in the here and now, like the presidential campaign? How many would like that? Yeah. How many would like to hear about the Port Huron Statement of 50 years ago? <laughs> How about the, the crisis facing students today? <laughs> uh, any other topics? That, Occupy. Huh? Occupy. Occupy. Occupy, how many want to hear about Occupy Wall Street? Um, yes? Um, how about a postscript on your generation? <laughs> you mean like an RIP? <laughs> or what? Not dead yet. I've got a 12 year old, he goes to seventh grade. What do you mean, like a, a reflection on? The, the right side of your spectrum, um, yeah, the collective amnesia, perhaps. The oh, okay, the yeah, you've seen that go up. That's, that's the short version behind me. Um, modern apathy. Modern apathy. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, n nobody wants to hear 
my thesis about Abraham Lincoln and Reconstruction. <laughs> it's, it, it's one of my obsessions in life. I've been studying the Lincoln presidency for a very, very long time, and I feel like I'm on sacred ground here and in the presence of people who probably know the story in their hearts and in their blood, and uh, I'm not sure what I can add, but um, I can't leave Springfield without uh, sharing some thoughts about Lincoln. Anything else? How much time do we have? When do you wear out? In 90 minutes of <laughs> 60 minutes, something? The students, do you have to leave? Were you forced to come here? <laughs> is, that, is that why you're sitting towards the rear? Um, all right, well, um, let, let, let me uh, s start with this just briefly. Uh, consider this the academic part of the evening. Um, I have a, um, uh, some would call it a theory. I don't think it's a theory. I think it's a, it's a, um, a model drawn from my experience of what I've seen happen and what I've reflected on for a very long time. I like to believe that there's a pattern to events. Um, some people um, uh, see um, religious patterns. Some people see gender patterns. Some people see class patterns. Uh, I try to drill down much more specifically because uh, I started as a student, graduate student, but I became an organizer of poor people in Mississippi, Georgia, and Newark, and I had to relearn uh, my approach, and I found it helpful to um, uh, borrow from uh, the philosopher John Dewey's idea that you learn only by doing. And, and that's, that means that you listen to people, instead of telling them what you want them to do, you listen to them and you discern a pattern in what they want to do. Uh, and you focus on people that are apparently apathetic. Uh, uh, because people that are already active, like many of you, don't need very much. Some books, some friends, a small group, off you go. Uh, with your obsessions. Other people would rather do nothing or think they'd rather do nothing. So uh, learning by doing uh, is, a, is an approach um, uh, in politics, in community organizing, in liberation theology. It's, a, it's an approach that starts with uh, trying to ask kind of where people are coming from. Now you, you, you approach it with your own views but your goal is to get people who are apparently not doing anything to begin, to begin feeling their power, going to meetings, and creating energy where there was none before. So it's like a ripple in the water. You change the equation by s suddenly getting 50 or 150 people starting to do things who were never recognized by the power structure or by the authorities uh, before and didn't know they had it in their own power. So you always feel that you're adding some positive energy to the, to the, uh, to the picture before you. And, and um, the, the, so the approach that I take is, is based on that experience and, uh, and invariably, um, therefore, social movements uh, arise out of seemingly out of nowhere from the margins, and I can I can kind of explain it with this chart that there's from from an organizing perspective there's always two forces, the force of the social movement and the force of what I call the Machiavellian order. Others call it the power elite or the power structure or the establishment. We can get into the details, but uh, at the beginning of any uh, movement, uh, there doesn't seem to be anything there on the surface. It's never predicted. There's never been a movement that was predicted by a journalist or by a philosopher before the day it happened. Nobody predicted the 60s. Maybe in general, but they didn't say tomorrow 
it starts. Uh, so it's, it's always kind of by, uh, by surprise. Uh, there's a, a, almost a, a magic to it. It's really more like chemistry or forces gathering critical mass. But what, what starts at the margins uh, will begin to march towards the mainstream if you follow the bottom here. Marching literally, but I also mean just in general. And by mainstream, I only mean getting to, to 10, 20, 30 percent support where you begin to be noticed by the population and by the uh, established groups. Getting from the margin requ requires um, desperation or courage or will or the vision of the young, the ability to see things that nobody else sees uh, uh, in front of them. Uh, and, and often it's inspired consciously or unconsciously by what's come before. Uh, for instance, when the four young men at North Carolina State in, in Greenville, in, in Greensboro, uh, North Carolina, were, were discussing what to do in January 1960, they, um, they really, f they were fed up because they felt the, the problem of having to either accept or reject the world that their parents had left for them, a world in which they would be perpetually second, second class in status if they accepted it, but they didn't know how to break it beca because it had been going on uh, for, for so many decades and so many centuries. And, and one of them uh, said that uh, in his uh, church group, somebody had mentioned the uh, concept of a sit-in. And that went back to 50 years before that time uh, to sit-ins in manufacturing plants in uh, the industrial Midwest where my family's from and where we are tonight. And the idea of a sit-in, that is putting your body on the line obstructing the uh, status quo, uh, making yourself uh, positioned to be in the face of authorities who previously thought you were faceless. That's what I mean. And, and so the idea wandered th through the river of time, through an atmosphere that people thought was uh, very, uh, apathetic, and yet it had a, a certain uh, vitality, a current that was carried. And so they began, and, and, and sometimes it's like striking a match and it does nothing, there's no fire, no flame. There had been sit-ins attempted before 1960, in the 40s and the 50s, right up, right up through uh, 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 their generation. A few here, a few there, but nothing had ever really taken off. And, and suddenly there were 70,000 people in jail uh, in, from campuses in the South. And then they were debating sitting in in jail and clogging the jails and obstructing the criminal justice system where they didn't think they would get a, a fair hearing. And suddenly there was a real crisis in the existing Machiavellian order which had contained this segregated base, uh, uh, especially in the South, for the Democratic Party, for the political system, for the cotton economy, the, the rest of it. Uh, so they, they started to um, draw on some past traditions, and what they were doing echoed well with uh, a large number of people, their parents, their communities, northern liberals. Uh, it also deeply antagonized and inflamed their adversaries. And the adversaries, the segregationists, were so um, uh, apparently obsolete or irrational in their thinking that they lost the moderates and they kept in moving towards the mainstream, uh, not only in the African-American community, but in the United States as a whole. Um, Sometime along the way, uh, they decided on their demands. Uh, movements really um, arise from a moral woundedness or injury, but also there has to be a concrete uh, objective. In this case, 
people like myself uh, who are on the Freedom Rides or working in voter registration went around and talked to people who had been through this before for many decades in the South and, and asked people, well, what is it that you want? We're here as organizers. We can bring some resources. We can help. But what is it? And invariably, uh, we heard from people at the door, we want the right to vote. That is, we didn't start saying, Let, let's do a voter registration drive. We heard over and over from people who said, I fought in the Korean War, and one thing I want before I die is the right to vote over and over, men, women, the elderly, that, that was it. Um, and, and so it became natural that the focus of the general movement to disrupt the segregated South was pointed at the right to vote as a way to dislodge the power structure at the time which rested on seniority in the House and Senate by white segregationist diehards who had their power because of compromises going back to Lincoln and 1876, which we'll get to. But at the time, they had their power because um, of the suppression of the black vote. So you would have a senator from Mississippi in power, but only... Uh, uh, due to the vote and contributions by white people. If the 40% of their district or area that was black was simply enfranchised, it would upset the entire arrangement. They would have to adjust to a very different reality. So that was the idea. It was kind of um, transcended the, the usual debates about radical versus reformist or militant versus moderate because um, uh, we didn't know where this was going. We knew that for the right to vote you could get killed. So it was hardly a moderate act. Uh, and, and we also didn't know what would come after. But a lot of people made a five-year commitment to um, uh, go into the most terrorized areas of the South uh, and uh, try to mobilize people to vote, knowing that many would, would, be, would, would be risking death. Um, and after five years, we would see where things stood. And people like myself, who came down as journalists, uh, much like I am now, we got involved, we got arrested, but our job, my job at least, was always defined as to travel north and arouse students to support the South. Start to build campus by campus organizations that would raise this issue of uh, civil rights and what could be done about it in support of the South from northern campuses. That's how Students for a Democratic Society initially got built more than, more than anything else. Uh, so by the end of the five years, uh, we had arrived at the reform and the majority support we won. Does anybody know what we won in five years? The Voting Rights Act. Voting Rights Act. Uh, with a lot of details that we didn't really think of when it started. But from the moment uh, it succeeded, uh, and our very Machiavellian president Johnson declared, we shall overcome, which resulted in mixed feelings, but this is what happens when you win. Uh, from that time until now, certain people in our country have been very unsettled by it and hate it. At this time now, they're doing everything they can to get around it. Uh, they want to make sure that not very many students vote, make it difficult, and no longer have any Justice Department monitors in areas of the country where there are uh, violations of the Voter Rights Act that have disproportionate effects on uh, uh, African Americans or uh, Latinos. And those areas happen to be coincident with the Confederacy 
and with the Wild West. Um, I've noticed, though, that the Confederacy has slipped northward into southern Ohio. I don't know about southern Illinois anymore, but there's some of this going on in Pennsylvania. But it's just an illustration of how long a process turns out to be. It would, it would almost be too much to consider at the beginning. Tom, friends, we're going to be talking about this and defending our, our job 50 years from now. Are you ready for that? Most people can't conceive of being ready for that. It's not continuous activity. It's up and down. You win some, lose some. But in general, uh, the lesson I'd like to uh, 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 pass along to anybody who needs to hear it is that change comes. It comes inch by inch. It comes no matter how impatient, how radical you are, how urgent you are, it comes very slowly. And as you gain ground, uh, uh, there's always a threat that you'll lose that ground. What happens is that the movement, when it wins, has already, I'm talking about the activist core, they've already become so um, affected by what they've gone through that they tend to divide into people that want to stick with the original goal, the right to vote, and other people who are more inclined to want to attack the whole system that makes this discrimination and disparity of power um, uh, happen over and over and over. So the movement divides between uh, somewhat more pragmatic people and somewhat more radical people. On the Machiavellian or the elite side, the same thing is happening. They're concerned, some of them are actually concerned about the morality of perpetuating this suppression. But generally, their job is to preserve the social order, the benefits and privileges that accrue to them, the reputation of the United States in the world, uh, economic stability, and so on. Right? So, so, uh, as the movement intensifies and becomes more and more successful, it does um, win over people from the established side of things. Uh, the Kennedy brothers would be one obvious historical example. Uh, churches that uh, had long been silent about segregation in the South. Uh, unions uh, were the principal backers of the uh, organizational backers of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Justice. Uh, uh, and, and some of the foreign policy people uh, were saying uh, that this was really, this racism in the South and the violence was very bad for the image of the United States in the contest with the Soviet Union called the Cold War for the hearts and minds of the people in the non-aligned countries who were a majority of humanity. And uh, I know this for a fact because I was uh, asked by a CIA-connected front group of the CIA to actually write a pamphlet. Uh, that was, I, it was called Revolution in Mississippi, and it was published around the world to show what American students were doing fighting for civil rights and justice in the South uh, in order, I, this was not my intention, but uh, it, was, it was to portray a more complicated America that did include some good people and not just um, people with clubs and cannons and shotguns and lynch ropes and all the rest of it uh, because there was a genuine interest uh, in uh, improving the race relations in the United States in order to improve America's reputation uh, in the world order. All those things were in play. But in any event, uh, Johnson did come around to sign the bill and say, we shall overcome. Uh, and the law was signed. Uh, in doing so, in, in bringing Johnson and the federal government around to the achievement of the Voting Rights Act, what we didn't know at the time was that the segregationists would not go away, but would become stronger and more cunning. We thought, uh, and this is a, maybe a, the perception of a young person, we thought that the um, 
Segregationists were the dying order. It was such a goofy idea uh, with no foundation whatsoever. It would just go away. We, we had no idea that it had permanence among some people because it had to do with their identity and their uh, income and their uh, status and their power and so on. And, and in, in this process, when you win, you also uh, deepen the counter movement against what you've won. They don't go after it right away. In, I mean, they don't go after it directly and say, let's go back to legally disenfranchising 26 million people in America. No. But they say, let's stop uh, implementing the Voter Rights Act. Let's stop uh, funding it. Let's stop uh, 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 harassing the, the Confederate states. Uh, let's worry more about fraud. What about a lot of these people? Um, uh, from other countries sneaking in here to vote. Um, uh, let's, 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 let's not go back to the polls tax exactly, but there should be some fee uh, and, and some requirements before you vote. And they're, they're camouflaging the idea that many people actually should not be qualified to vote uh, because they have not accepted the idea of equal voting rights, even in an unequal society, they have not accepted the idea. And I'm sure there are some in this room that have the same feelings uh, subconsciously that some people are more entitled to vote than other people are. Uh, I know when I was in office, people always calling me up saying, I, I'm not voting for any of these judges. Tell me who to vote for. I don't know anything about these 26 judges on the ballot. You tell me, Tom, and I'm saying, it's not my job to tell you. Just my advice is don't vote for any of them. Just vote for what you know. But there's this implicit feeling among people that have internalized it that they're not really that qualified to vote. Um, and other people are more qualified. So. That's what happened. We underestimated the reaction, and so today in 2012, we're still fighting about the Voting Rights Act, and the, the fight has moved north. I think that's progress. You may not. It's the only progress I know, because when you win, you lose. It's, an, it's, a, it's like yin-yang. It's, it's a dynamic in which... Uh, the protagonist and the antagonist are in a constant fight uh, for uh, some kind of advantage. And uh, the other thing about winning that's problematic uh, is that you demobilize your base because only real fanatics like yourselves would go out at night to meetings <laughs> like this. Because pe people wanted the right to vote as part of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They wanted to vote 15 minutes of the year. They didn't want to go to meetings all the time about preserving their right to vote or, or the latest uh, legal uh, assault on, on it. They, and so there's a, a natural relaxation that occurs when you achieve something. And there's a heightened hysteria when you lose something, no? Wouldn't you feel that way? So it's kind of in the natural process that as the winning side demobilizes with its having its benefits, the other side that has apparently lost becomes more awakened and more competitive uh, and, and more uh, sophisticated about how to limit the damage if not uh, reverse things and go back to the old ways. Finally, uh, and I'm not gonna give you other case studies, but we could apply this to anything as the evening goes along. You're in a period which we're in now, which I, I think of as the, uh, the battle now includes memory. Um, I don't know how to do this on a, uh, a linear chart because it begins and ends in memory. Begins and ends in memory. If those young people had not remembered the slaves, had not remembered the spirituals, had not remembered what somebody told them about a sit-in, uh, they, they would have been like me. I, I was blank. I knew not, I was the perfect middle-class specimen. I, I knew nothing whatsoever about the past. 
Um, it had been suppressed. It was kind of a lobotomy. Um, uh, unfortunately, it was called higher education. <laughs> but I knew nothing. There were no courses on this stuff. Anything taught at this institution on this stuff today is as a result of then. Before then, not there. So, uh, in the battle over memory, uh, the movement activists and uh, you know they kind of we kind of try to promote the best legacy, the glorious years, and and instill it in our children and and through the media, um, as as um, uh, as something that's satisfying but also necessary to help keep the progress going. Other people uh, on the losing end of that particular debate uh, don't want the memory remembered. They don't want the memory rekindled. They, don't, they want the memory to go away. Or there's a third group that would like the memory to be politically controlled so that it appears that actually the president and the US Supreme Court and the government were responsible for the reform. Uh, so it, it then becomes the reform in which um, thousands of people suffered, time was wasted, years were uh, derailed, people died. That's all testament to the genius of the flexibility of the American system because Abraham Lincoln liberated the slaves and Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Bill. It always comes from the authority figures um, rather than from the, the people uh, in the streets or uh, in, in the fields. That's the theory. Um, you think I'm going to go on. I am, but only, only briefly because we not take, take some questions. I'm gonna, I don't know if this is backwards or forwards, but this is the, the, the theory re-explained. Movement on the left. Pillar in the middle is our society. Reform has entered the established order. The reform is in blue. Notice it's incorporated into the existing social order. Uh, it's better to think of you've, you've altered the social order so there's room for the reform, but the social order is still there, right? Uh, and then there's a backlash against it, a Tea Party type backlash, but it could be or the John Birch Society. The backlash is, is a three-pronged usually. Uh, there's um, direct backlash and then an attempt to co-opt it to make it seem like this is further proof that we concoct these reforms through our presidents and our leaders. Uh, and then there's also a containment effort to make sure that the memory does not become contagious and uh, uh, galvanize, occupy Wall Street or some later generation of uh, activists. Uh, a little more on the reform. The reform is the blue and what I would define for conversation as an actual reform because we know there's a lot of empty reforms and rhetorical reforms, but what's real uh, would have at least these three things. One, it will, it will create an opening in the social structure, an opening in society for people that have been excluded. Two, it will empower a group of people that previously had no, had, had no awareness of their power and it will institutionalize some power. And three, it will actually provide benefits, uh, like it, it, it makes it easier to, to keep the sheriff off your back. Or, you get a uh, social security check, or something that's uh, tangible, right? Uh, here's another way to look at it, um, uh, the circular. <clears throat> you have these two forces of the established order and the social movement, and they're in constant intersection. Uh, and reform is the space that we occupy tonight we're allowed to have this meeting because of freedom of speech and because of codes adopted by universities uh, 
that have been fought for for centuries, for decades, and we could lose this freedom of speech uh, if, this, if the cycle reversed, say, during a war on terrorism or something that uh, caused people to want to roll back previous gains. So all the good things that we have, in my opinion, came from social movements, but got translated into government achievements or establishment achievements and rest only on our memory and our ability to, to react when uh, the counter movement tries to interfere or take this uh, uh, away. In, in the case of um, <clears throat> the uh, labor movement uh, that uh, hosted, uh, partly hosted this meeting, um, in the beginning, labor was considered, the idea of a union was considered an interference in free trade. It was, it was a, an organized conspiracy to interfere in trade. It was a criminal act to entertain the idea of forming a labor union. Uh, that had a very long history, that notion, uh, and it's still, um, very alive in U.S. foreign policy if you look at the World Trade Organization, if you look at NAFTA, if you look at uh, the sweatshop economy around the world. Uh, what Western powers generally, particularly the United States, are trying to do is repeal barriers to trade that include organized working class movements or popular governments in Latin America that would interfere with freedom of trade as if that was the highest value on the ladder. And things like minimum wage or child labor protections or clean air, clean water or, or collective bargaining were lesser values that were really impediments uh, to a future under m m more corporate rules. So it's very alive, this idea. In the, in the legal arguments about the arrangements of the uh, international economic order. Um, and it took the um, several um, efforts over many, many decades to organize labor unions. It included divisions between types of labor unions. Um, it involved uh, wildcat strikes, uh, revolutionary uh, organizing activity like the Wobblies. It also included the reforms of the Wagner Act and the New Deal uh, after the workers took over plants in, in uh, Michigan and Ohio and elsewhere, passage of those laws. It became um, collective bargaining, became recognized. That's the world that I grew up in. I, I grew up in, in uh, Detroit. My dad worked for Chrysler. Um, everybody was making good money. Um, it was, a, it was a segregated society, but if you could get entry to the, uh, the, the world of uh, labor management uh, contracts, uh, you, could send, you could send your kid to the University of Michigan. It didn't really, it didn't hurt either that it only cost $100 a semester to go to the University of Michigan. <laughs> but, but you see, now we're, now we're at a point where 7% of the private sector is unionized. Most of the unionization is in the public sector, and, and all that was gained is slowly being lost, and a new world is, is, uh, uh, is being contested with the outcome uncertain. So this, this process is an ongoing one. Okay, that's it. Um, now, Let's, let's now have, um, have some questions and discussion on any of the subjects you wanted to talk about, and then I'll try to roll it up into uh, some concluding remarks. But consider this the alternative to the usual break for the restroom in the middle of a <laughs> stay here, focus, tell me what you think, <laughs> ask questions. How does this apply? Yeah, in the back corner. Yeah. I'll repeat um, you. Were you aware of the 
writer on the defense appropriation bill last year. Yes. Yeah. Now, what's your opinion of that? Was it to uh, threaten Occupy Wall Street? No. <laughs> or preserve the wealth of them? Well, the short answer, I don't think people know what you're talking about. The, he's talking about a uh, language in the um, defense authorization bill that seems to enable um, domestic spine to be expanded uh, to include um, the uh, army and the um, uh, the the people usually in charge of foreign wars, um, as well as um, coupled with other language that makes it a crime to materially support groups that are associated with uh, terrorism. Material support is not defined exactly, but it could mean advocating for their point of view, meeting with them, uh, publishing books uh, by them. And it's got the, uh, el some elements of the left very concerned about whether we're becoming a uh, imperial presidency again. And I don't know how to compare it to 1919. Habeas Corpus. Yeah, Lincoln. Um, habeas Corpus. Um, these are all, uh, during war, Lincoln imposed habeas corpus. Um, it, it's, it's connected to encounters or battles or wars with foreign threats, alleged or otherwise. Um, so my short answer to this is that until we um, find a way to conceptually and politically and legally end the war on terrorism, um, it's not likely that we can do anything but fight back against these intrusions on civil liberties. What concerns me is that it, the legislation gave the government the right to hold people without charge indefinitely. Yes, and that's contested in uh, a, a recent court a recent court decision. Uh, you know but I read it that way, and it 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 only uh, adds to my belief. Let me let me tell you why I stated what I believe, because others don't agree with it. The ACLU, Human Rights Watch, and many civil liberties groups will not take a position against the war on terrorism will not take a position against the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Pakistan, which I think are the underriding reasons for these draconian uh, laws governing or limiting or suppressing protest or individual liberties. So my theory from my own life and from my history reading is that until you reduce the so-called threat, the war on terrorism threat, to as close to zero as possible, you won't be able to galvanize enough forces to roll back these intrusions. That's how McCarthyism went away. When McCarthyism, which was introduced parallel to the beginning of the Cold War, the nuclear arms race, the Chinese Communist uh, Revolution, it was inflicted on people for years and there was a limited response. And then in the 60s came a movement that attacked, this is what SDS did. Little did I know, I was just a naive writer for the campus paper, but in attacking the idea of the Cold War and refusing to believe that a thermonuclear arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union was and should be a permanent fact of life, that all the world should be divided into pro-US or pro-Soviet. In attacking those notions, we were undermining or helping undermine the basis of McCarthyism and repression. So the House Un-American Activities Committee 
disappeared in the 1960s. Uh, and, and, and as the exposure went on of the misuse of power, uh, gradually uh, the American people turned around and, and, and pushed some politicians to end the repression. Nothing's ever totally ended, but hugely significant. But it was because we convinced people that, that the answer to the question of is the Soviet Union a threat was threat to what? The threat that we're worried about is the bomb. And we want to reduce the arms race. Kennedy, in 63, before he was murdered, uh, uh, had been so shaken up by the Cuban Missile Crisis that he, he moved towards coexistence with the Soviet Union as opposed to regime change. Uh, and he actually negotiated a, a nuclear test ban treaty in response to Women Strike for Peace and many women who were protesting strontium-90 in mother's milk. So it was this combination of social movements, Kennedy's experience and trauma in the near uh, annihilation with the Soviet Union that led to that, then he was murdered. Um, so that's the conclusion I draw. Um, so I'm against the language you're speaking of. Um, I don't think that it'll be conclusively defeated until the war on terror is exposed in the way we exposed the Cold War as a, um, a, you know, an exaggerated, politically useful threat to move uh, American society to the right. And I don't know if we're there yet. I think, do you feel that we, there's a war on terror that is justified? A lot of people do. I don't know if they know what they're talking about, but it's, it's out there. And any politician who says, no, let's do away with it, so far would be done away with in an election, I think. So it's, that, that's where we are, I think. Yes, next question. Yeah. Uh, what's your interpretation of, of the problem that unions are having now? Do you, do you see that as just uh, the upper class attack on the middle class and that's representational of it? Could you hear the question? Be a little more specific. What's my impression of the attack on unions? Well, yeah, right now, you know, of course, you know the news in Wisconsin. Illinois, we're facing attacks on our pensions. I'm a, I'm a retiree from the state. And it, it's like it just won't end. And of course, there'll be, there'll be uh, legal, uh, legal cases against it. Yeah. But is, is that... In your interpretation, is this just a matter of the upper class trying to union, break the unions, and the middle class gains less, less power and, and becomes some sur subservient, more subservient? That's what's happened. Uh, I'm, I'm from Wisconsin. I, I followed that. I was up there a couple times. I followed it closely. Here's the deal with Paul Ryan, I think. Paul Ryan and I are completely alike in background and totally opposite in philosophy. But he, he, from, from a lower middle class white rural point of view in Wisconsin, uh, in a recession, uh, you start to question whether the money that your taxes are giving to the government are coming back to you. And somebody can rub that, that's what it's about. They're going to black people in Milwaukee, you're told. Well, yeah, they're not coming back here to Oconomowoc. That's what you're thinking. Uh, so so since, since there's no hope of taxing the rich, apparently, and they've given up, you know, on the, the only way to get more money in your pocket is to cut taxes uh, that go to the education and health care of other people. Not much money, but some money. Uh, I think it's, it's a minority of Americans that feel this way this strongly, but I think that's, what's, that's what the arg argument works on. And that's why it's interesting. People in Wisconsin really hated the governor, Scott Walker, but they didn't want to replace him with a mainstream Democrat either. 
Uh, it's the only way I can read it. Some say, oh, no, no, the election was bought by the Koch brothers. Well, then it's hopeless. Uh, Wisconsin's a small state. People talk a lot. They know each other very well. Uh, you can tell what people are thinking. And the Koch brothers were a factor. Oh, absolutely. Couldn't have done it without them. But, but the vote was decisive. The vote was to retain, in effect, beat up on Walker, and then retain him, hoping he's chastised, chastised, as opposed to replacing him with a mainstream Democrat. So, and this is the state where AFSCME was created, I believe. Wisconsin. Some say, no, it was created 50 years earlier. I don't know about that. But, but I know, uh, for instance, one of the authors of the Port Huron Statement, Paul Booth, is alive well and the organizing director of AFSCME. And they lost in Wisconsin. And I think they knew that they were likely to lose, but the base, the membership, the mass movement wanted to push ahead. And um, so the union leadership didn't want to be blamed for kind of telling them, don't go too far because we don't see it. A victory here. So they just let it happen, let it play out. A lot of people had very utopian hopes. I certainly did. I mean, it was incredible. It was one of the great social movements of the last 25 years. But you notice it fell just short because of that Paul Ryan factor out there. That would be my guess. I also come from Michigan. <laughs> And, and this was written at a UAW camp. This says that the labor movement is the anchor of any progressive social change, but it's losing members <coughs> rapidly. This is 1962. It needs to step it up on civil rights. It needs to make alliances with people in other communities and movements. It's becoming conservative. That's what in our youthful arrogance, that's what we thought. But we weren't wrong. It, 50 years later, people are still kind of ha having the same discussions. Yes. Who else? Yeah. Uh, in the night, in the night. Where? I can't hear. We had a couple of students here. I don't see a hand in the air. You must not be a student. You're pointing to people who are students. Faculty You're a faculty member <laughs> trying to get your students to talk. Okay, I didn't. See, I can't see over there. I can see sort of. Who is it? Who is the student that wants to ask a question? <laughs> this gentleman. Is it Max? Mike. Mike, yeah. Going back to what he was saying about terrorism, um, there was a piece in Rolling Stone recently about some people who were arrested in, involved with Occupy Cleveland were trying to blow up a bridge, and it turns out that the guy who recruited them and arranged everything was an FBI informant. And that's clearly entrapment, but they don't seem to care. But my question is, do you think there's an effort to paint Occupy as sympathetic to domestic terrorism so that they can be uh, Crack down on using the same uh, legislation that they used for foreign terrorism? Um, I, I think Occupy Wall Street um, kind of came out of nowhere as a, as a hugely important um, uh, response to Wall Street. And um, the tactic of occupation. Um, caused media attention and, and allowed movements to gravitate around the, the fact of uh, occupation. It, it also um, certainly allowed every police force uh, and uh, FBI agent to join the occupation as observers at the very least and take notes and report back to headquarters about what was going on. And, uh, where, uh, where it was opportune for them, they certainly, uh, uh, I think, facilitated or helped 
uh, the, uh, some outbreaks of violence and expanded the scale of it in the media to make it seem like it was Leningrad in 1917 or something. And they played on middle class worries of mayors that nobody wants their lawn camped on forever. Um, I think they underestimated how mayors would not allow a permanent occupation. This poor guy that's running for mayor that I support in LA, uh, Eric Garcetti came out and told the occupiers in LA, stay as long as you want. And that has been endlessly repeated on television, sinking his, his campaign because he didn't know what he was talking about. He just was caught up in the excitement of it. Um, I don't know if the Homeland Security people really coordinated the phone calls between the 16 mayors about cracking down on the encampments. I don't know. I know that they didn't talk to Viragosa, the mayor of LA. Um, I know he did it his own way. Um, so, I mean, in general, I think it's very important to know that you're being watched, monitored, surveilled, and uh, infiltrated, but not be so paranoid that you're immobilized, and to realize that probably your failures are your own doing. I mean, you could easily say the 60s were destroyed because the FBI COINTEL program. I don't think so, but it certainly was devastating. People died, people went to jail, there were informants, there were instigators, also, but, but we pretty much also ha had the, the dominant role in doing it to ourselves in the late 60s. That's what I think, yep. Um, yeah, this being an election year, um, I just kind of wanted to get- Oh, your, yeah. Thoughts on, on one thing, you know, keeping in with your theme of movements, um, you know, the Citizens United decision that uh, created super PACs, I just wanted to get your opinion on um, what effect do you think that is going to have really on our political system? And if we're talking about uh, movements to, uh, or, or reforms, um, the trying to get some kind of campaign finance reform, you know, obviously pretty difficult to get something like that through a Congress, but you know, what effect do you think that super PAC decision has on, on any kind of meaningful campaign finance reform and or this coming election? I, I think it's probably the foremost issue that needs to be taken up right away, along with the budget and the Iran, coming Iran war uh, by January. And, um, the, the only way to put a dent in or push back or reverse um, Citizens United is for the, the squabbling groups that are against it to unite into one group. It's not asking too much, but it's, it's uh, I'm, a, I'm a utopian. Uh, and and um, focus on it, uh, knowing that Obama has already put himself out there, so uh, start with a constitutional amendment state by state with the idea of not trying to get all the way to the end seven years from now or something, but just the threat of a unified movement trying to repeal Citizens United in as many states as possible allows you to give speeches, hand out leaflets, build coalitions, go to jail, get arrested, anything you want, get in their face, you start to be noticed uh, uh, if it's a real organizing drive. And then anything might happen. First of all, if Obama's reelected, he, uh, he may be able to sometime appoint two new Supreme Court justices, change the whole equation. Uh, and on the other hand, what Roberts did, according to everybody I know, on the Obamacare decision, was political, it was sophisticated. He did some real damage while appearing to be for Obamacare, but, but it was political. He didn't want the image of the Supreme Court to be too damaged or tarnished with the image of not being neutral and, and impartial. Why is that important? Because in the Machiavellian order, 
Pe people are supposed to stay within the framework of the nation state and believe that the institutions will work if you sit in long enough, if you write enough letters, if you cast enough votes. And the Supreme Court is the, um, the, the dominant institution in, in projecting the idea that you've, you've always, you, you, you can always get a case, you can always get before, it's not, it's not closed down, it's not wired, nothing is fixed. And the, I, so I think there's a lot of pressure now on the Supreme Court because of the rising perception that it's an apparatus of the Republican Party and Karl Rove never went to law school. And, <laughs> and it's, it's largely true. And so they don't want that. Do you want another four years of hammering at the idea, if you're in the establishment, hammering at the idea that the Supreme Court is rigged? I don't think so. So I, I, I don't know the way out of it but I do think that they're very, very vulnerable for those reasons on this issue. Um, and, and then uh, it, it, the, the other thing that is more within our power, um, do you have a law school? What's your near, nearby law school? Champagne. 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 I, you know, one of the, one of the decisive um, currents in the desegregation decisions was a generation of young black and white attorneys at a time when segregation was the constitutional order. And they decided that they would have to figure out a way to fight a legal battle because you couldn't undo it without undoing the court decisions. And so that gave rise to a generation of Thurgood Marshalls who worked for decades. A lot of people said, they were, you know, too um, um, moderate or you can never work within the legal system, won't work. But in the end, uh, they did succeed in creating what we call a civil rights bar, which is all kinds of lawyers that take up cases of the poor, police brutality, uh, uh, landlord-tenant uh, battles, uh, voting rights, the Advancement Project in LA is one of them. And on this issue, I, I noticed because the politicians are on the side of money, maybe other reasons, law schools don't have, are not working at trying to generate a new generation of lawyers who say uh, what you saw on the signs outside, that corporations simply are not people and money is not an instrumentality of free speech. It's nonsense. It's violations of the First Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment, and if they're not, we need a clarification. That fight has to go on among young lawyers because they will have the spirit, tenacity, will, determination to do it. Because this is a form of insidious um, disenfranchisement of the whole population and, and the legalizing of the corporation. And of course, it, it again goes back to Lincoln. Did you want to ask me anything about Lincoln? <laughs> yeah, all right, we'll get to it. Yes. I am curious to hear your opinion. Um, you mentioned that the apathy and the unawareness, and as an educator, I'm very concerned that many of the people in the general population are the type that wouldn't come to an event like this. I'm not saying they're all Judge Judy types, but the people that are in, in amongst us. In the what? In amongst us. The people that are in amongst us that, that don't vote or that <clears throat> really are racist, that are out there and they're coming out of the woodwork like man. How do we as a group, besides, um, I'm glad in a way the pensions are being attacked, even though my pension's being attacked, because it's getting into these people's pocketbooks. And the, but I mean, without economic reform, how do we, aside of economic reform, how do we reach out? Is it in the classroom? And how are we going to reach out to these races, to these teabagger types that are not even teabagger? Not political. Well, at this point, for me, discussion's over. I'm trying to defeat. Because sometimes defeat is a teacher when words don't work. Um, but more generally, I mean, they, 
they're, they're right. Uh, you know, when you hear um, good old Ron Paul talking about these wars are unconstitutional, he's right. Or they don't have any constitutional basis. Um, and and w when he says Wall Street rules, he's right. Um, banks got bailed out, we got sold out, he's right. The, the weird thing is, it's almost as, as if Mr. Paul, who I correspond with, just has one, it's kind of like Paul Ryan, there's like one thing not clicking in that fertile imagination of his. Um, and I've tried this argument, you may try it. Uh, from a, a pure market libertarian standpoint, you're telling me that starting after your election, uh, we should uh, go back to preventing people of color from eating at lunch counters if the owner doesn't want them. Shut down the golf courses. How about Major League Baseball? Where do you want to begin? Airplane rides. In other words, they're so um, jihadist, they're so fundamentalist, that I don't think they've actually thought through, when they've argued, Ron Paul and his son, uh, argue over and over that um, it's an interference with commerce to have uh, these um, criteria applied to the marketplace, which means at the lunch counter. That, that, that there's nothing unconstitutional about denying service to somebody based on the color of their skin. I don't know if he actually believes that or what's up. I, I just, I don't, sometimes people get so certain of their position that you have to keep trying to unscramble it. Uh, some people are out and out racists. I don't think that's a majority, but I, I do think there's a lot of libertarian and market thinking where, uh, and a lot of hatred of government or suspicion of government with no understanding that, um, you know, the reason we have a government is that the market failed. That's why we have a government. Otherwise, we'd be part of the, a, a British colonial possession. Um, so, you try that. Um, I, I also think it's, it's so obvious that... Um, Whatever you think of Obama, the stimulus, which made everybody go nuts and led to the rise of the Tea Party, the stimulus actually accomplished quite a bit that people are afraid to talk about because they think it's wrong. They like if they've, it's like sex out of marriage, <laughs> having the government create jobs, stimulus, sounds vaguely sexual, we can't admit to it. Uh, for example, if, if, you, if you look at the chart, we're losing, uh, like, I forget, was it 800,000 jobs a month, the, the, the month that Obama was sworn in? It was like, that's heading towards, I, I, I don't know what would have happened. And when they passed the stimulus without Republican support, uh, 700 billion, 800 billion, 900 billion, depending on how you count. And, at the, at the, and then the Tea Party um, arose. And as the stimulus money was spent going to um, green jobs, teachers jobs, healthcare workers, cops, firefighters, um, you could see on a chart that the, the plummeting, the job loss ended and, and turned around uh, and has not fallen uh, sense in any significant way, but has actually gone up. If logic matters, which I want to advise you, it does not matter whatsoever in politics. You could, you could, it's like an optical illusion. You could say, well, Obama saved 900,000 jobs because it went from 800,000 loss in a month to 100,000. But others pick on it and say, only 100,000, that's not e even an, the, the number of people who are looking for jobs. It's nothing. Well, it is nothing in one sense, but, it, but if you re revise the optics, 
it's something because we were losing 700, 800, 900,000 jobs a month. And, and I don't know what would have happened. So uh, $200 billion is in there for uh, weatherization, insulation, uh, green technologies, solar uh, uh, production. Is, is $200 billion nothing? Yeah, I mean, I chaired the Solar Energy Council of the State of California 30 years ago. It's not much. Chump change. But $200 billion in that budget, 0910, has to be compared to Clinton's maximum achievement in energy conservation funding, which was $5 billion. So you could go from Clinton at five to Obama to 200 and say, Obama's way better. It's optics. And I think um, you have to understand that people almost always believe things through filters. And if you can find a way to break the optic and break it down with, with some um, Q&A format, they might, I mean, the craziest people are the ones uh, I'm a card-carrying Social Security guy, right? I got it in my pocket. The, the ones that are holding their Social Security card saying, down with government, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, uh, where does that come from? It's not insanity. It's, it's a belief that they don't, that, that government should not be helping anybody and that what they have is deserved, so extremely deserved that it didn't even come from government. I think we have Roosevelt, the great Machiavellian of my birth, to thank for that. He had this optical trick. You know, he said, we're not, he said gentlemen, we're not going to fund this out of taxes. We'll call them payroll taxes, but not general taxes. And so we won't say we're raising your taxes. We'll say that we're setting aside your money for your retirement. It's your money. And that's why these loopy, most, more libertarian types believe that, because Roosevelt made this calculated decision that he couldn't get the bill passed in the middle of a damn depression if it raised taxes. But if he said, we're putting aside your money for your retirement, then it was all right. Same with the GI Bill. You know where the GI Bill came from? It wasn't a socialist idea, it wasn't a big government idea. American Legion. The American Legion, which uh, my, father, my father was deeply into, proposed that, uh, that, that, that we should pay for the services of every GI returning, and they should get what you could only wish for today, free college education, the whole list of things. But it was their money, because you had sat at home, you didn't fight the war, they went over, suffered, they lost their minds, they lost their brothers and sisters. It's their money. And it's probably the most popular program in America's public policy sector. And it's a government program. <laughs> but, if, but Roosevelt and Trump, they dropped the idea that it should be a government program called the GI Bill. And they got it through Congress by saying it was an American Legion program as if somehow it remained immaculate from the touch of government, just going straight through the legion of veterans into my dad's pocket without having to recognize that, it, that government existed. So th there's an element of propaganda wars and education and argument that is really very important. And I think the most important thing about it is to always listen and try to figure out what's the filter that this person is thinking through, and is it, is it reversible, or do they have to be defeated and stopped? So I think it's a very hard, very hard skill. A student in the back. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> you, 
You can elaborate all you want. I, I have a sense that you have a lot to say here. Um, well, first, the, um, uh, I'm a witness to the fact that before internet, there were social movements. <laughs> I have evidence. I have letters that we wrote to each other on yellow pads and put them in envelopes and stamps. I have no idea on earth uh, how these movements happened because I'd be the first to acknowledge that our technology was very meager. Uh, but the movements happened in any event. Second, I think that the, um, the uh, internet or the, the web uh, does have great potential far beyond what uh, our movements were capable of. Um, I th it, there's a fight over the control of it and your concern um, that it's, it's not face to face, it's screen to screen is very uh, uh, compelling. I, I totally agree with that. But, but you have to see the, um, um, the positive side which is the, it, it, just if you look at Wikipedia, the, the this information being amassed in a relatively democratic process and, and made instantly available to anyone in the world on any subject with ways to correct it and argue about it is, is kind of mind-boggling to me. Or the, the ability for people in this room uh, with uh, you know, a cell phone to instantly know that something is happening that's urgent and that they have to go out in the street, somebody's been killed, something has happened. That, those are, the, the ability to organize um, an online protest uh, of hundreds of thousands or millions of people in, in relatively short order, all that I think is the, the raw materials for, of a greater participatory democracy. Um, and as with everything I've said, everything is a mixed blessing. I think you're looking at the cynical interpretation, which I share. I have a 12-year-old. I can't get him off it. Uh, he talks back to me. He knows more than I know. He's, he's running the house. And he's not qualified to run the house, but he's running the house because he runs the technology. Um, uh, and, and what would you do? Let me just ask you to go further. What, what would you do to prevent or curb this, um, this tendency to, you know, hypnotize so many millions of people? I wish you were more cynical, but I misinterpreted it. It's really, it's really easy. You, you steal files. You, you raise money and you buy, you buy a file that has 100, 175,000 Jewish voters in Florida who are leaning towards Romney. It's, a, it's, it's unbelievable. And there's people working 24 seven to amass data, data on all these people that is, as if somehow you can t tell which way they're going to vote by where they shop, what they buy, what they eat, how old they are, and so on. Um, uh, I, I think that's, um, what I, that's what I mean by a mixed blessing. But you can certainly do what you just said. We can, we can hook you up immediately. Would you like to be in touch with the two student, student organizations in Montreal that just achieved the greatest victory of students in the last 10 or 20 years. They're right there. You can, you can be right in touch with them instantly. And they had a division between the militants and the moderates. They had a civil disobedience strategy. Um, they um, reached out to Quebec society, which is much more egalitarian than other parts of the world. Uh, and 
they, uh, they elected the PQ, the Parti Quebecois, uh, last week throughout the Liberal government. And on the first day in office, the new uh, provincial premier um, rolled back this, the fee hike and eliminated the repressive law against uh, demonstrations and protests and just said she was done with it. Uh, now, those who don't believe in electoral politics may not like this version of what happened. Um, remember, all we're talking about is not having a fee hike and not throwing people in jail for protesting high tuitions, <laughs> but a victory is a victory. They had 350,000 people in the streets in May in Montreal. Um, and why do I know this? Uh, well, my wife's Canadian. I have friends in Montreal. That would be the old way. Call them up and ask, what's going on? But I'm, I'm also embedded with something called Rabble, uh, which is an uh, online newspaper, very good newspaper. You can, go, you can get it online, it's rabble.ca. Um, and we constantly interact, and I, I publish their stuff and they publish mine when it affects uh, our North American interests. And, 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 and when, when you're in touch with these people, there's links that allow you to verify. We're having debates in real time about how much money actually was rolled back. And is the student aid part still in the budget? The answer is yes, so they got a roll back on fees and they kept their student aid. And, and knowing this at the moment it's happening is very liberating from an organizing perspective. What you do with it is, is not in the uh, operating manual. I think we need an organizer's operating manual for online activists, but they're on their way. And that's the biggest student uh, achievement that I can think of. Spain, Chile, Argentina, nothing. So uh, it's worth spreading the word, but also getting online and finding out what these people had to say. You can, you can uh, Skype them, you can talk to them. Yeah? Yeah, uh, I was just wondering uh, about the uh, situation with Iran. And, uh, Where were you? <laughs> yeah, um, do you see a, as a war is probably going to be inevitable, or do you think there is still room for some kind of compromise? Do you think, what do you think of Israel's position? Israel seems to be hyping an existential threat from Iran if they get nuclear weapons. Should they have nuclear weapons? What do you think that's going to I don't think an existential threat can be confined to one society in, in, in a war. It becomes all very rapidly. But um, what do I think? Um, look, for three or four thousand straight days, I've been trying to stop the wars in this region. That's what I do all day. Uh, and I've seen progress, but it's so slow, I don't even bother sharing it with people because you have to really... It's what I said, inch by inch. Um, and people have been telling me since 2007 that there's going to be a war with Iran. And so far, I've been correct in saying it's not true. Hold on. Um, but uh, what's going on right now is um, something quite different than an actual beginning of a war. Uh, what's going on is Netanyahu and Romney, Netanyahu and Adelson are meddling in American domestic politics. They're trying to stir up a war fever in the midst of a presidential campaign. For Romney to be um, associated with that uh, is technically treasonous. I don't believe in the concept, but it's on the books. And, and he. Um, he should, he, I don't know if he knows what he's getting into, but he's an old business partner of Netanyahu at that Boston Consulting. Um, so they've been in business together, and, and um, it's not helpful. And he, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. 
I just think he thinks about Florida. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but I've read everything he has to say, and, and I know the people working for him are the same neoconservative intellectuals that got us into Iraq. Um, and I know it's a tough question, but you don't make it easier when you try to rattle a presidential campaign to see you know, if you can get a military advantage. Uh, beca because if it starts, uh, it's, it's uncontainable, it's unpredictable. Uh, these are people that, you know, like Wolfowitz said, uh, I don't know if he's advising Romney, but he said uh, that the war in Iraq would be over in 11 days. <laughs> and then he got promoted. The Wildcat strikes and the occupations combined with the uh, Democratic Party left wing, combined with Roosevelt with his interests, and so we got the Wagner Act and Social Security in my parents' generation. So this would, this, would, this would happen again without our knowing quite how it would take place. I still think it would have happened. What did not uh, occur to us was that presidents and people like Dr. King would be murdered. And that was a decapitation uh, uh, of the coalition we sought to build because it, it sent so many people sideways um, and, and uh, into despair. Uh, and then the second thing we didn't anticipate was Vietnam because Johnson and the Democrats had said that they weren't going to send people like myself to war. Not going to happen. So we, we said, good, we'll support Johnson and our slogan will be part of the way with LBJ. It's true. <laughs> and no sooner had we done that than on the day of his election, the national security types in the White House were drafting the paperwork for sending ground troops, American ground troops. Kennedy had only sent 17,000 advisors. By the end of Johnson's first year, there were 130,000 ground troops. And, and that could only be accomplished with a draft, an arbitrary intervention into our personal lives. And I, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's too hard to see why the anti-war movement was born because there's nothing like a draft for a, a war in a place you don't understand to get your attention. I mean, it didn't take a lot of organizing skill. Uh, but so that all, went, that all went sideways and left me with a lifetime feeling that um, however intelligent I might feel I am or how, however well I can map out a situation, it, it may be the universe or it may be human frailty, but the, the future can never be predicted. And it's unfortunate because people want a prediction. Are we going to win? Will Wall Street fall? What will happen? And, and if you say, I don't know, it's hard for them to say, well, then I'll follow you to the gates of hell. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's true. I don't remember anybody knowing what was going to happen. You're going to be on this bus and somebody's going to firebomb you. So you talk about existential. I mean, that's pretty existential. Uh, and, and that's why it was so difficult to um, uh, retain the document because it was about achieving reform uh, by militant means towards a more radical vision, but achieving reform. So by the late 60s, people had thrown it out as if it was the fault of the document to not anticipate the, the, the revolution. But it really wasn't anybody's fault because um, we, we were dealing with the cards we were dealt by life. And, and uh, uh, nobody said, our presidents will be killed, King will be murdered. Nobody said the Soviet Union will fall. Nobody said uh, the things that you're experiencing now. The, nobody said the, the next generation of young people will be unable to find meaningful work. Nobody said even if we control the nuclear weapons, uh, there will be global warming and the world will end. So I think you're facing a similar existential quote-unquote dilemma of going forward when 
you can think your way into feeling it's impossible. All I can tell you is that some of us are still here <laughs> and, and it didn't turn out the way we expected, but it didn't turn out the way they expected it either. Uh, they, 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 no, nobody can be clear on that, but because you're human, you are not going to let global warming end the planet. If that sounds idealistic, I am not an idealist. I say that as scientifically as I can. Because you are human, you will not allow the planet to disintegrate. Uh, it, it may be harder than controlling nuclear weapons, but, but and, and you will not allow life to go on without a job. How and when and with what means to respond, I, I think Occupy Wall Street was a beginning. And it was sort of at the end of the beginning. Yeah. Now there's the election. And when the election's over, I think um, that energy will spring up again, uh, looking for, uh, you know, direction. And, and I, you know, I hope that uh, it's successful. Wall Street must fall. Um, but, uh, Since I'm Irish, I can't be that optimistic. So <laughs> just to, on page 23 in the footnotes, the Port Huron Statement says, despite the reforms achieved during the Depression in the 1930s, 1% of Americans still owns 80% of corporate wealth. That was the reform that we had been unable to imagine, that was our legacy, the 1%. And I bet somebody who wrote, read the Port Huron Statement wrote the phrase, the 1%, the because it's, it's in here. Uh, so it's one of those things that just goes on down through the river of time, but I mean, the time is coming. So many people are upset about this. I think you have a lot of, a lot of people to work with if um, plans can be hatched and unity can be achieved. So good luck to you one and all, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye. Well